we need to start making more conscious material choices. I set up an initiative called Make Fashion Circular. It's a tsunami of change. So in its very simplest form, what we do is we recycle waste nutrients back into usable forms of protein. All we've done in its simplest form is copy a process that has been going on in nature for 108 million years, uh, and we've industrialized it and brought it into the modern age to tackle some of the problems we face in our real world today. So you're collect you're, are you collecting the food waste in cities? How's, how's it working on the ground? You're collecting some food waste, bringing it to a central uh, location, and then where do the insects come in? Let me explain what a, a fly farm looks like in its simplest format. If you could imagine a very large cage of flies, we typically in a factory house about 8.4 billion flies in different stages of development. So that's more than one fly for every human on the planet, well, at the moment anyway. And we train those flies to lay eggs in one place. We extract those eggs from the cage and we hatch them and then grow them on different waste substrates depending on the part of the world and which of our businesses. And what we're left with at the end is a NPK, that's nitrogen, potassium, phosphate rich uh, soil enhancer and larvae that we then process into protein and oil for use in predominantly fish farms and shrimp farms across Asia. Okay, I, I mean, I have to pause for a moment and ask how you train a fly, um, uh, because I can't get them out of my kitchen in the summertime. So how how does that work? Well, it's um, I mean the, the whole process of getting flies to to live together is is challenging the sorts of numbers that we're talking about. So if you go back to the very beginning, um, what seemed like a great idea in late two thousand and eight, then set about a chain of five or six years of abject failure. Uh, as we tried to get large quantities of flies to live together. Of course, you can buy uh, hundreds of books, and in fact, there have been probably thousands of theses on how to kill flies, but none on how to make them live. So, so getting flies and understanding how to make them live is, is, is quite challenging. So we, our early success came really because, uh, I guess I was watching crime scene investigation on the telly with my kids one afternoon, and... I saw this person trying to take uh, larvae and flies off a, off a dead body and to age the body. So I rang up the Metropolitan Police, found out uh, who their head of forensic entomology was, who happened to be a South African, and I asked him if he wanted to come and make flies live rather than kill them. He said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So he now heads a team of uh, 52 R&D specialists around the world, just focus on making flies live. So. I mean, it give you some sort of basic challenge. So getting flies to, to live together is one challenge. Getting to mate is, a, is another challenge. We couldn't make flies mate in winter, which was the point at which we really nearly gave the business up. And went outside at the end of winter, so that would be August, September in the Southern Hemisphere, and about to go back and close down our operation, because if it wasn't going to work 365 days a year, um, it wasn't going to be industrializable into a, a real solution. And went outside and saw flies starting to mate. It was very early, coming up to dawn and uh, beginning of spring. And we now know that flies mate at dawn because when there's two flies together, it's like you know, a discount on a Big Mac. People, you know, the passing bird only has to make two extra swoops of its wing to get you know, a double quantity of flies. What I didn't know is how they knew it was dawn in springtime. And the answer is, uh, having rung up somebody who wasn't thrown out of school, uh, and ask them, you know, uh, what could be the solution. They said, it's very simple because the Earth uh, tilts on its axis as it moves around the sun. And this creates uh, summer in the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere at different times. And the frequencies of light to first bend over the surface of the Earth will also differ. So we isolated that down to quite a narrow uh, wavelength of, to the human eye, what looks a bit like blue light. And so then we could take all our breathing inside, away from sunlight, uh, and we could cause breeding whenever we wanted to. It's a bit like um, turning on the slow song at the end of a school disco. <laughs> you, go in, you go into our cages and turn on the blue lights, and that causes mating uh, and uh, winter you, or summer. Did you skip that step entirely, just trying some Barry White or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> no, we tried everything from music to humidity to heat to light to noise. 
and they're actually quite a sensitive uh, creature and they you know like to be to be quiet and have a restful time they like the nights off and like the lights out like some downtime and while we're, so, while we're talking about the flies yeah, there is a specific type of fly you use isn't it the, is it the black soldier fly yeah so we we, we start out using musca domestica the, the house fly and uh, we still play with some of the other 250 odd thousand species of flies there are around the world um but the the bsf or black soldier flies is particularly useful in that it really is an omnivore it'll eat a range of different uh, waste materials also it only um, eats in its larval stage so it doesn't eat as an adult so it's not a pest species the reason that you consider house flies a pest is that they live three four five weeks as an adult and they're always looking for food which is why they come into your house the uh, the bsf isn't looking for food because it doesn't really eat as an adult. It's just looking for a partner to make, lay eggs, and those eggs hatch into larvae, and they eat a lot. Um, what about this point around animal consumption then? So, um, using this is about using the flies or the uh, the fly the larvae, larvae for for, uh, for feed for other animals. Talk us through that. So the difference is is feed or food. If you think about a fish, a fish leaps out of a stream and grabs a fly because that's what it's always done. A baby fish will go down to the bottom of the river uh, after it's just been hatched and eat the eggs of other fish or the eggs of insects like a mayfly that might have laid uh, its eggs in the water. So they have been eating flies forever and day. If you think about a chicken in the field, a free range chicken, what does it do? It scratches and it pecks and it's looking for worms, it's looking for larvae, it's looking for ants, it's looking for, uh, for insects. That's what they do and that's what they eat. And in fact, uh, at, at, at home at our farm, if you look at the chickens, the place they go first and foremost to look for larvae is in the dung heaps. Because they, like Genghis Khan, have an understanding, innate, not obviously technical, that when a cell is breaking down in nature, two things want it. One is bacteria and the other is larvae. So therefore, larvae have some of the mess, best antibiotic, uh, which are called antimicrobial peptides, which they emit naturally to kill bacteria so that they can eat. When an animal eats those like a chicken, that natural antibiotic goes through to the chicken and its offspring. So it's only a natural process, and that's what's really interesting. And that's what fascinates us. So yes, um, food for, uh, for humans or feed is very interesting, but the thing that we concentrate on is feed for animals. And I think there's two reasons for that. Firstly, the market is immense around the world. And secondly, we are devastating our seas through the excessive fishing and production of something called fish meal. So fish meal uh, is hoovered up in the southern hemisphere near the pole. Uh, small fish, plus anything else that happens to get caught in the nets. Uh, mince it all up, cook it all up, then ship it to the northern hemisphere to put into fish farms, where, of course, the food ratio is negative. I mean, you know, you're going to eat somewhere between 80 and 100 tonnes of food in your life, depending... Uh, on how long you live and to show how inefficient you are you won't weigh anywhere near 80 or 100 tons the same thing is is true of other animals with one stomach they eat more than they put on weight to themselves called a food conversion ratio so fish farming is is, is as it currently stands although they've made huge strides not frightfully sensible it works for supermarkets because you can get a farm salmon a farm trout a farm sea bass on thursday afternoon rather than having some fishermen explain why the shelves are empty at your local supermarket because the fish weren't biting. So that's why we're really interested in the, in the animal side of it and the uh, production of feed for animals because it's a large industrialised marketplace. It enables us to, to concentrate on a, a few buyers and, and, and focus on the technical um, similarity between uh, flies and its replacement, which has been fish meal. Of course, we only started really using fish meal once we discovered sonar at the end of uh, the last World War, because then there was no more fishing. It was just called catching, because you just went to where the fish were. And this is just not either fair or a good uh, way into the future. But getting rid of uh, waste, or there's no such thing as waste, really. There's just stuff in the wrong place. And converting it back using a natural process into something that we really need has to make sense. Um, and that's what we do. At the moment, I just wanted to ask what the impact is currently or the potential impact that you can see for um, when, when this is rolled out more widely or, or, 
or to date. So I'm still talking about um, whether that's carbon savings or um, land that doesn't have to be used to grow food for animals. What are, what are the benefits of this? I, I guess there's two or three things. Firstly, uh, if you take, so a typical factory of ours takes 90, over 90,000 tonnes of organic waste that would, organic material that would otherwise go to landfill. When that breaks down uh, anaerobically in landfill, of course, it emits uh, nit uh, a whole host of, um, uh, of CO from CO2 to methane and everything else that, that is harmful in terms of emissions. Secondly, there is always the, the possibility of leach from landfills contaminating water tables, which is why around the world, most countries from the Middle East to Americas are, are banning organics to landfill. And the third thing is, I guess, we, we desperately need new novel sources of, of protein. And at the same time, adding organic material in the form of what we call insect frass or insect, uh, it's the compost that's left at the end of the process, back to our soils makes sense. You see in the United Nations, 61 planting seasons left. Uh, you know, we're depleting our soil so rapidly that to put our organic waste into landfill and holes in the sea, or, or sorry, in holes in the land or back out to sea is really not sensible. And so at AgriProtein within our, uh, our, our three brands that we, we operate, in fact, as the Insect Technology Group, Ag AgriProtein is just one of the brands, we take a, a, a range of organic waste substrates and convert them back into protein and soils uh, for use in a circular fashion back into back into the world of agriculture, as has always happened in nature, but we've just got so distant from the nature that we've forgotten. Um, someone said, is there enough waste to feed your factories at scale? So I guess this is about volumes and collection. And Rachel's then put, does this make it more possible to localise food production in cities, for example, so around the, the geography of this? So, um, yes. So we target cities with probably at this stage more than a million inhabitants. Um, and that gives us more than sufficient waste to build one or two factories around those type of cities. In the Northern Hemisphere, the waste pits are always to the east of cities and the Southern Hemisphere to the west. Uh, that's where the waste is currently transported. That's driven by prevailing winds. That's why the East End is cheaper than the West End in, in the Northern Hemisphere and very often vice versa in the Southern Hemisphere. So we interrupt those supply chains. So we provide a lot of um, uh, less ton, I mean, waste costs money to move a ton per kilometer, uh, you know, per ton per kilometer distance moved. And so by interrupting those, we can make protein much nearer to the cities that generate the waste. Uh, and that's helpful and useful. We also then don't need to, for example, move fish meal from the Southern Hemisphere where it's produced to the northern hemisphere where it's consumed, we can make protein uh, in the northern hemisphere where it's used. So cu cutting down on carbon miles, cutting down on landfill, uh, and cutting down on, uh, or rather starting to, to generate uh, some reasonable volumes and contribution towards adding compost back to our soils. And you, you, we haven't actually spoken about where this is happening now. I mean, you. you you, you've given us some, uh, some you've suggested there is this uptake around the world um, and certain countries are more open to uh, this development than others. But where are the hotspots now? Uh, I think everywhere is a hotspot. Each market is, is very different. So, um, and we have the, the two major, we have the input, which is the waste, and we have the output, which is the protein and the soil. So you can't move the waste, so you need to have, therefore have your factories near the cities. You can't move really the compost, uh, so you need to put it in or factories in countries where compost has a value. For example, in Hong Kong, it has no value because uh, there's no agricultural business on the island of Hong Kong, but a huge amount of waste. So it's also driven by gate fees and people's understanding of you know, how much it costs to, to get rid of waste. So Europe uh, is, is a very interesting market. Our first factory will be complete in the Netherlands in, uh, I think, March or May next year. Uh, our factory in California is complete uh, structurally. It'll take another year to finish our permitting there. We're also pushing quite hard into Asia, uh, particularly into Japan and South Korea. Uh, 
and which have very developed food collection and separation structures. And we add more value than just composting that waste because we produce protein from it and we also produce compost. So around the world, it is, it is beginning to take off. So we've had a question here from Gary who says, I get frustrated when I hear about ideas like this because they seem so logical and simple. Why isn't this happening more widely? Why can't we just get on with it? So I think there's two or three things. Um, it's, it's a very be easy business to conceptualize. It goes on at small scale around you all day long. To get it to a large industrial scale has taken us, as I said earlier, many years of failure and probably $50 million of investment in the early stages. Uh, we raised another $105 million next, last year, which will uh, help us build the next couple of factories. But with a factory costing, you know, sort of $40 million, um, it's a capital intensive business as well. To get it right at the scale that regulators, cities, local inhabitants and governments will enable and facilitate and take seriously. So it's not that easy a process. If anything was easy, everyone would do it. <laughs> okay.